Over to me, right? Yeah. Okay, right. Um, right, I'll just introduce myself. I am Nina and I work, to, I work in our corporate learning part. So what we do as a team, um, we work with corporate, so it's private sector, um, trying to, well, encouraging transformative change. So we know that the biggest companies in the world are the ones we need to change the most quickly. So we try and work with, in partnership with them to make transformative change so through sustainability learning, leadership learning, uh, learning kind of further down the, the down the tree, if you like, so operations. But one of the things that we are really passionate about and is kind of part of our USP really is nature connection. So the, the way we think about it is that if you're going to make some positive decisions about the environment, if you're going to become um, somebody who who is part of that transformative change, then you need to be really passionate about what it is you're actually protecting, what it is you're conserving. Um, and so we don't feel as though, as though um, you're going to do that unless you actually have a connection to nature. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that, about what we mean by that. Also, I'm going to, but I am going to start with a little bit of context because um, uh, we know there's an environmental crisis. I don't need to tell you that. Um, but I want to give you a little bit more context um, around that um, and why that just makes us think that it's just just so much so much more important that um, that we make this connection with nature that we have lost over the decades really well centuries if you like so let me turn my screen can you see that's okay Divya good right so let's go um, so why um, is nature connection so important? So let's have a look at some stuff that's been happening over the last, um, well, for quite a long time really, that's led to the situation we're in at the moment. So we know that most of the damage that's been done to our planet has come about since the industrial revolution. This really took hold in the UK in the 19th century. Um, great surge of industrial activity. It gradually rippled out through much of the rest of the world but it has had enormous consequences on the species that we share our planet with. We've pitted ourselves really against nature. It has become a situation of humans versus nature. We've squeezed nature's ability to survive. And this has led to a huge loss of biodiversity. Biodiversity, is the definition of biodiversity is the variety of life on earth, including animals, insects, not to forget plants and soil. So, okay, so the UK has been a trailblazer for so many developments over the centuries, um, but along with that, and I'm aware that we have somebody online who is not from the UK, so um, I didn't know that <laughs> coming, that was coming, but um, in terms of UK specific, we have led the world in destroying our natural environment. Um, a study has found that UK is one of the world's most nature depleted countries. So we've lost around half of our biodiversity. Uh, the, um, the average um, globally is that countries still have around 75% of their global their biodiversity remaining. In the UK, we only have 50% of it. This means the UK is in the bottom 10% globally for biodiversity. So that's a very depressing statistic and, and, and not one that, um, that we're very proud of. So we've really lost a degree, humans have lost a degree of knowledge and understanding about the natural world and we've forgotten its value. Um, and like I alluded to early, earlier, when you don't know something or you don't value something, then you don't protect it. Okay, just a second. Just gonna mute that, thank you. All right, so significant damage has already been done. Like I said, um, this, this graph only goes back to 1970. Um, if we went all the way back to 1900, the 1800s, the picture would be even worse. But the speed of decline of biodiversity of our living planet is absolutely dramatic. So there's one really stark and key impact of humans and our lives is that since 1970, planet Earth has lost 69% of its living species, 
or it's non-human, pardon, it's non-human living populations. So that's two thirds of living beings lost in just 50 years. That might be within your lifetime. So right now, 25% of species are threatened with extinction. And that future extinction rate is projected to take another big leap. You might have heard of the idea of the sixth mass extinct extinction. We're talking about an extinction on the par with the dinosaurs um, many, many years ago. Um, and this is due to projected changes over the next 50 years. If we carry on the way we have been in the last 50 years, it's going to lead to uh, you know, an enormous uh, amount of um, extinction on our planet. Um, so the living organisms that we've already lost and those at the threat of extinction um, have led to a real drop in planet's biodiversity. Um, but why? What's made this happen? So really it's because our planet is becoming less wild. We have replaced wild land and species with ourselves and our domesticated animals and plants. For example, 90% of the mass of mammals on the earth is humans and our livestock. So that leaves just 10% for wild creatures. So really, you know, it's not actually as easy to get amongst nature anymore because we've lost so much of it. We've lost our connection to it. We've prioritized ourselves. So what specifically, what are we doing to drive biodiversity loss? I said that 90% of the planet is filled with us and our, our domesticated animals. So today humans extract more from the earth and we produce more waste than we ever, ever have. We take natural resources, we make something with them, we use those products and then we throw them away at the end of their lives. Um, you may have heard that referred to as the linear economy. But the biggie here is agriculture. It's the, the, the most significant enemy of nature. The reason for that is before, because the more food we grow, the more land we take from nature and the smaller natural habitats for those creatures become. And therefore the more, more diff most difficult it is for nature to survive and, and thrive. If we're going off the land, um, in the sea, overfishing has had a devastating effect on many, many species. And this is largely caused by industrial fishing. So these are enormous ships often trawling at the bottom of the sea, dragging enormous nets behind them, the size of three aeroplanes, just scooping up every single thing in their wake. And this kind of fishing is dominated by a few, dust, few industrialized countries and international corporations. Also, we are much more mobile than we used to be. So long distance, transport of goods and people, including tourism, has grown dramatically in the past 20 years. And this has led to more pollution and the spread of invasive species. So these are species that don't belong in particular environments that have been imported either intentionally or unintentionally from other environments. And these invasive species outcompete our native species. They spread disease and they could be widespread killers. Um, if we think away from animals here, one disease that I'm sure we're all aware of, certainly in the UK, is called ash dieback. Um, this is affecting a large proportion of ash trees in the UK. And actually, this is a fungus originating from Asia, and it's predicted to kill 80% of ash trees in the UK. And according to the Woodland Trust, it's thought to eventually cost us £15 billion. That's the British Society. So it's not just devastating for the natural world, it's also very expensive. We have to replace those trees with something. We have to pay to chop them down. We have to pay to scientifically assess them. Are they dying? Are they dead? Should we get rid of them? What is the impact on all the trees around them? And there's a lot of uh, impacts of, of, of these things. I don't worry if you can't read all the words on this. Um, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that nature isn't just important because it looks pretty. It's, it is really easy to think of nature as handsome lions and cheeky monkeys in the jungle, but nature is everywhere and humans rely on it for a whole range of things. And nature provides it to us for free. Let's give you some examples. Um, if we think of provisioning services, fish, water, so fish that we eat, water that we drink, and pollination by insects and birds. Now birds and bees and other insects are responsible for pollinating 
up to a third of the world's crop production. So without them, we would lose 30 odd percent of the crops that we grow in you know, globally. Without them, we wouldn't have apples, cherries, blueberries, almonds, and many other foods. And the soil underneath our feet is teeming with bacteria and more microorganisms that are absolutely vital for releasing nutrients into the plants that we grow. And those nutrients then transfer to us. We need them to keep healthy. And then again, back into the oceans, life from the oceans provides the main source of animal protein for many people, particularly in poorer parts of the world. And then many of our medicines, um, along with other complex chemicals that we use daily, such as latex and rubber, these also originate from plants. And then we have what we call regulating or supporting services. We have trees, bushes, wetlands, grasslands. These are all environments that naturally slow down water. So when it rains very hard, um, they slow down the absorption of water. Um, and the water doesn't run off these kinds of services like it does in, I'll say, for example, concrete in, in a city. So flooding is less likely to happen when these environments are preserved. They help to absorb rainfall. They provide shade from hot temperatures. When they're removed, flooding is increased. And trees and other plants clean the air we breathe and help us tackle climate change because they suck up our carbon dioxide. In exchange, they give us the oxygen that we need. And then further afield, we have coral reefs and mangrove forests. They act as natural defences and they protect coastlines from waves and storms, which are increasingly battering our coastlines worldwide. And then of course, leisure, recreation. We love to be in nature, we love to experience its beauty. We love to go whitewater rafting, we love climbing. We value nature in and of itself and being in nature contributes to our well-being. And I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, so it's really clear how much we rely on nature um, for our life support systems and that their destruction is a threat to our very existence because we just can't replace the things that nature gives us. Okay, so I've given you some facts and figures. Um, but how do we fix this? Well, that is a very big question. There's so many things that can be done that need to be done, brackets are not being done, to reverse the devastating loss of nature. And sometimes thinking about it can be overwhelming, but there are actions that international organizations, governments, companies, local councils and schools, et cetera, need to take to address the impact that they're having on nature. But there are plenty of things that us as individuals, as consumers, as employees, as part of a family, part of a community, things that we can do. Um, one place to start is really close to your home is to connect with nature. And that way, we're more likely to want to protect and conserve it. So let's have a little look. Um, but when I say that nature connection, what exactly is it and why is it so important? Well, nature connection is more than just about going out and walking a dog, okay, and being in the forest. It is about your relationship, an individual's relationship with nature, and your perception of belonging to a wider natural community. So it, if you think about it, I said earlier, human, we have got into the situation of humans versus nature. But we're not separate from nature. We are all creatures that uh, were created to be on this earth. Um, so we are at one with nature. We should be at one with nature. So this isn't really about nature connection. This is about nature reconnection. We are part of nature. And one of the big problems is that we, we think we're not. It's not just about contact, contact. It's really an emotional, cognitive, behavioral connection with nature. The deeper we connect with it, the more likely we are to make some really good decisions that, that conserve it. Let's dig into a tiny bit of um, intellectual stuff here and I'll make it as simple as I can. 
This is a guy from a guy who called my, um, uh, Ives, can't remember his first name, but he has done a lot of research into nature connection. And just so you know, there is a lot of research about it, um, about the importance of nature connection and, and uh, to uh, how it leads to more responsible behavior in the natural environment. Like I said, it's not just enough to be in nature. We need to connect to it on a much deeper level and find deeper meaning in our relation to, with nature. And to experience this real connection is mostly likely to lead to behavior change, to us making some changes in our lifestyle and to looking to influence other people to do that as well. Um, so let's have a look at five ways of connecting with nature. And if we start from the left and we work up to the right, as we go upwards, our connection gets more profound. So this researcher sees material connections, the first one, as the shallowest connection. Um, and up on the right, philosophical connections as the deepest one. I'll tell you, I'll give you more information about what those five things are in just a sec. But he suggests that the first three, material, experience, cognitive, are not sufficient to create real change. If we want to create real change, we need to reconnect people at the emotional and philosophical level. Right, so what do these things mean? Here's a bit more explanation. If we turn to material, okay. Um, so on a material level, we use the environment for us, for our resources, for our materials. So for example, um, on this level, I might be nipping off to the allotments to pick some courgettes for dinner. Okay, so and this is very much about controlling our materials, isn't it? Growing what we want to grow for our benefit. So um, this is an example of a material connection with nature. And then we move up to our experiences in nature. So we might spend time in nature. We might have memorable experiences. We might relay them to other people. We had a nice time. So, um, uh, oh, hold on a sec. So the children love putting on their wellies and kicking the fallen leaves about in autumn. It wears them out. And then we sit down and collect them as many different colors and types of leaves as we can. So this is about having good experiences, is about perhaps creating memories um, and nature being the backdrop to that memory. But it's still not enough. Then we move on to cognitive. So what's so kind of on an intellectual level, we're moving up the, uh, you know, the scale here. So we're thinking about nature on an intellectual level, observing what nature does, how seasons work for example, how seasons change the landscape. I've got good memories of this during COVID when we took daily walks in the same rural environment and we could see the, the, the seeds, the, sorry, the fields where the farmers were growing um, oilseed rape. You could see how they were, the, you know, how quickly they grew, how they turned from just green stalks to yellow plants and when they were harvested. This, so you, you observed the effects of the season. Um, so, this might be in a more of a wild setting. So when I come to the meadow in June, I, I count more butterflies than at any other time. Maybe I'm starting to think a little bit more deeply about that. Nature instinctively understands seasonal cycles and we need to listen to its lessons. So here you're starting to think a little more deeply about um, the way that nature operates. Okay, this is getting into the business end of it. So an emotional level. At this level, our inner connection is becoming deeper. Our emotions and our feelings are being engaged. We realize that losing something will have a deep effect on our emotional state. When I sit and watch the sunset at the beach, it feels like home. It's my place and I could never be without it. So this is something that's getting into your heart. And that's when change is more likely to start happening. This last one, philosophical, is the deepest level. And if we can get people connecting to nature at this level, systems and behaviours are most likely to start to change. So it doesn't make sense to me when people refer to us and nature as if we're separate. Our superior intelligence has enabled us to exploit nature in really complex ways. But surely that makes us more responsible for protecting it. 
So here kind of some thoughts are about how our relationship with nature, our responsibilities towards nature, um, our development alongside nature. Um, so this is getting into real deep, deep connection, deep meaning, and um, really starting to, to you know, to, to make profound um, connections. This is where we want people to be ideally for them to start wanting to make some serious changes in their lives. Okay, so we know a deeper connection to nature is mostly likely to lead to behavior change. Um, and this can be in the form of what are called pro-environmental attitudes and behaviors. It's great, of course, to have pro-environmental attitudes. And actually many people in the UK have pro-environmental attitudes, a very big um, proportion, but very little times does it convert to pro-environmental behaviors. Um, it can lead to the real willingness to conserve biodiversity. And this is all um, shown by research and also willingness to pay for conservation of urban green spaces. Maybe you and your community get together and you put a fund, put together a fund to, uh, to, to, to make a meadow in a certain part of your local area. And also it's better for social interaction orientation. People who spend more time in nature are more likely to react to, to to liaise, uh, to um, relate better to other people around them. It's also great for well-being. I'm sure you know that. This is very, very well publicised nowadays. Reduced cortisol levels, of cortisol, cortisol is the hormone responsible for stress. So it reduces those, le those levels and a generally a lower stress response. And well-being and happiness. So the kind of well-being, kind of happiness and well-being that can be can be can be gained from time in nature is comparable to the happiness and well-being that we get from having a secure income and a good level of education. So it's really actually quite fundamental um, what being in nature can do for us. It's not just once going to the park; it's it, you know regular regular exposure. Um, there are very well publicized mental health benefits of being in nature. It's also good for learning. Um, we learn better overall when we are people that spend more time in contact with nature. It increases our working memory and our attention span and better impulse control. So maybe you don't reach for those crisps quite so often <laughs> and improved focus when we are working. Okay, so this can nature connection, I guess that happens when we visit natural places. Um, let's see. Now this, um, it looks really complicated. There's lots of lines and lots of decimals here, but what you're looking at here is a uh, graph from a survey from the Office of National Statistics, the ONS in the UK. Um, and it is saying how far people travel to spend time in nature. If you go all the way to the right and you look at the top green line, you'll see that by far the majority of people, when they visit natural environments, they travel less than one mile to get there. So this is going to be people's local parks. This is going to be somewhere maybe where they walk the dog. It's not going to a fantastic mountain is not driving to a beautiful lake 10 miles away. This is very, very local and it can be in urban environments. So this very short walk to a park um, could be in an, an urban park, an inner city urban park, or it can be a beautiful park or, or a rural environment, um, uh, you know, farmland out the back of your house. But what is really important is the majority of interactions in nature are with local places. So many of you, you know, you have a connection to a tiny forest, perhaps. Tiny forests are based within a community and say a local park. And so we know by far the majority of visits to nature are made to police places very close to people's homes. So this could be the park where your tiny forest is located or your nearest tiny forest is located. So this shows it's so important to get, give really good access opportunities for people near to their homes. Okay, so who connects with nature? Um, when we look at children under 16, this survey asked uh, the places that they visited last month. We're not talking about last month because this survey was released about two years ago. 
we can see that children under 16 visit local urban green spaces more than any other natural space. So we know that most countries, most uh, nature um, experiences are we're very close to us. And this shows with the under 16 children, it's urban green spaces. Parks um, it would be a massive proportion of this. And actually the same is true of adults. They are very big visitors to local urban green spaces. 36% of adults say they visit local parks frequently. And here we look here, we see that children under 16, um, if you look at the top green line, 67% of them, two thirds of them are outside at least once a week, which sounds like great news. But then it is worrying that bottom there in the orange that almost a quarter of children go outside less than once a month or never. And I guess we can exclude perhaps walking to school in that category. We're talking about additional, additional uh, interactions. So there's some great news there and some, you know, kind of concerning news as well. Who connects with nature? Nature access is unequal in this country. People who are on a lower incomes and from black, Asian and minority ethnic, ethnic backgrounds are less likely to spend time in natural environments than those from white backgrounds. So 69% of white uh, people in the UK are outside at least once a week compared with 42%. So that's a really big difference between the, the, the two groups. Um, so um, that has many explanations, but it, it, it's, a, it's a fact. And similar, similar statistics uh, bear out for deprived communities, those in, um, who live in uh, environment, the deprived um, environments with low incomes. Um, and the, the most deprived 10% of our population 58% of them go outside at least once a week, and the most privileged are out 75% of them at least once a week. So um, this is not a problem we're going to solve out so quickly. It ripples through to many different societal factors, but um, there is an unequal access to nature in this country. But despite time spent in nature, and there is some good news here, the Office of National Statistics and much other research has shown that although the vast majority of people show concern for the damage to the natural environment, there is a big gap between the number of people concerned about it and the actions taken to improve it. What I've referred to as pro-environmental behaviours. Spending time in nature simply is not enough. We need to connect to it on a deeper level. So turning to how we do that, well, um, on the programmes that we run at Earthwatch Learning, we do it in many different ways, either in, mostly in person, is what, in person is what we prefer to do, but online we, we also have a go at it. Um, one thing we are, ask people a lot about is their favourite moment in nature. We ask people just to take a minute to reflect and report back on their favourite moments. And this moment can be a regular thing that people did in the past. Oh, when I was younger, every Saturday I used to dot, 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 or oh, we went to an amazing place in Scotland and the mountain and the birds. It could be a unique nature moment or a regular occurrence. And not even in a fantastic environment. It can just be a local place. Um, the, sometimes the beauty can be in the mundane. So um, we really like asking, asking this question and people can get very sentimental and enjoy talking about this. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be with ch just children, but scav natural scavenger hunts. So we might send people off for a walk and they need to connect, uh, sorry, collect plants, flowers, acorns, bird feathers, things that maybe speak to them as things that speak to them in a certain way, things that they think have some beauty, things that are just uh, representative of something, um, you know, the natural environment, things that are representative of something in their own lives. Um, awareness activities. So these can, may well be done um, still in one place where we ask people to notice things around them, to see things, maybe to close their eyes and to hear things or to smell. Um, and these can be very connecting activities as people really tune in to the environment around them. 
Meditating in nature. I know that meditation is not for anybody, but this can be a very, very strong connection. Um, fireside stories. Um, so, you know, lighter, lighter fire, pit lighter fire in the outdoors, in your garden, wherever it's responsible to light a fire. Um, and talk about things. Be in the outdoors, wrap up warm, be in the outdoors and talk about time you've spent in nature or just talk about anything you like, talk about your story. Gardening, I'm sure some of you do some gardening, I don't, um, but this is a, a very good way of, of connecting with nature. Going barefoot, so go to a local area that, um, and, and take your shoes off um, and concentrate on feeling what's under your feet. How do the textures feel? Are they cold? Are they warm? Are they squelchy? Are they soft? Are they hard? Um, and follow a squirrel. We you know we see them all over the place and they some they run away from us and they disappear from somewhere. Go and follow them. What are they doing? Climbing a tree, hiding some, hiding one of their nuts? Are they digging up something? Uh, where are they? Where do they go? Try and kind of have a little snapshot into their lives. These are all sorts of activities that, that you can do, that you can uh, lead with other people. Um, and they are just really very simple and don't require any resources. It's just being there and paying attention. Um, I don't know whether um, we have anyone here who wants to share one of their own favourite nature moments. Um, I know Mel, you can't talk because you're at work. I wonder if anyone wants to not be shy and pipe up and say something about your favourite nature moments. I'll give you a few moments to reflect. If you don't want to speak, that is just fine. Right now I'm sitting here and like, when I feel the sun on my cheeks, that itself, like it need not be very big or profound, is it? It's just yeah, something that makes you connect with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You don't even need to be on outside necessarily. Thank you. Has anyone else got any moments that you can recall? <laughs> we have some. No worries, don't, it's, it's okay. Uh, um, we, have, we have something in the chat. So I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Morning sit spot routine, that's lovely. Well, that sounds nice. Yeah. Yep. Finding that place that you, you really, where you feel really comfortable and sitting, perhaps cross-legged in the grass on your own and, and observing what's going on around you. Um, maybe you've setting your intentions for the day my our yoga teacher says set your intentions for the day um, and uh, and focus and relax and try to empty your mind of, of everything it's not easy to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah another thing I like is just watching my bird feeder so yeah I have my bird feeder set up like quite close to my workspace so it's like when I'm focusing and it's like a little too stressed or at work I just take, take a break and just eat go look at it so yeah just focusing on the birds the behavior and yeah just, um, just you know, what's in there yeah becoming fascinated by the behavior of those little creatures yeah okay i just want to show you a little video uh, might give you some other kind of ideas or inspiration about nature connection Let's hope it will play. Noticing the good things in nature is good for you. Having a connection with nature is proven beneficial to the well-being of both humans and the natural world. But the decline of nature shows us that we need a new relationship, a new approach to engaging with the natural world and therefore working to preserve it. Nature connectedness describes that relationship. It shows us that it's more than just contact, knowledge and exposure with the natural world. It's about having a relationship with nature. But how do we go beyond simply engaging with nature? How can we develop a more meaningful and emotional relationship? Take a moment to pull and listen to the sounds. Touch the bark on the trees or walk barefoot on the grass. Why not take in a view or notice how the leaves move in the wind? Try tasting the flavors of nature. 
and smell the flowers. Harming nature is harming ourselves. Extend the sense of yourself to include nature. What can you do to look after nature and the animals that inhabit it? Form an emotional bond and love for nature. Note the good things in nature, the joy and calm it can bring. Find happiness and wonder, peace and tranquility. Consider what nature means to you. It inspires us to make music or create art, and we can use nature to represent an idea or a feeling, hope, wishes, love, a new beginning. Take time to appreciate the beauty of nature. Engage with the aesthetic qualities, from the smallest of details to the large and grand. Appreciate natural scenery. These five steps make up the five pathways to nature connection. Nature does not have to be about getting from point A to point B. Instead, stop, pause, engage, and connect. Okay. Right. Just go. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No. Okay, I just want to finish off with um, something to relax you. Um, hopefully, my sounds will work. Okay. Um, so, all I need you to do is just finish, just to finish, just to relax and listen and reflect. Livia, can I just check you can listen, hear me over the birds? Yes, I can. Great. It's been a tough week at work and you know as you get some fresh air that you'd rather flop on the sofa. But the woods nearby are tranquil, surrounded by trees and running water. And you've promised yourself you'd take, you'd take more regular exercise outdoors. Within just your first steps among the trees, you breathe in the cool air and the damp smells of the forest, and you can feel your stress levels lowering and your mood improving. You stop and take a look all around you, and you're reminded of the woodlands you played in and foraged in as a child, as many local children before you have, and hope that someone has thought to preserve them for the other children. You can feel your senses sharpening as you move through the darker parts of the woodland. You can hear the sound of running water and the rustling of small mammals dancing through the undergrowth, retreating from your footsteps. You feel curious and alert. You stop beside an ancient undergrowth of oak. This makes all that effort worthwhile. You touch the tree, smell the soil, and notice the sounds around you. You wonder about the interconnections of the beautiful ecosystem around you and bend to dig out a piece of earth alive with mycelium that connects the roots of different plants in an area, allowing them to share nutrients and to even communicate. You're reminded of your own connection to this landscape, the system that you're part of. It's time to go now, but you realise to start weekly exploration, you resolve to start weekly exploration of this woodland to make you feel at home in this place. You just try to understand more about the threat to this woodland and the importance of playing your part to protect nature and promote the careful regeneration of nature's spaces. Perhaps thinking about your own fundraising for this. Turning to your work life, you know you could do more to contribute to your business strategies for nature and you start to consider how you'll do this and how it'll engage your colleagues. Despite a week of long days and pressured deadlines, you return to the woodland and you're so glad to be there. You've made an immediate start on your action ideas. You have a good story to tell and you make sure you visit the woodland every week. When you need to find your momentum, you put in a call to your close friends and resolve to remember those cool spring days in that special place. So there's a lot of evidence to back you up um, about nature and creating change. 